Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're watching a message titled, A Long Way Off by Pastor John Pomeroy. Amen. If you didn't know who I am, I'm John Pomeroy. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Westside Community Church. And if you didn't know, we have the most amazing students in the world at Westside Community Church. For days. For days. Uh, if you uh, if you have a student who's in junior high or senior high, we're just about to end our normal Wednesday night program, but we have a bunch of uh, camping trips and uh, retreats and hiking trips all throughout the summer. So be sure to get uh, them plugged into uh, to those because we have uh, found here at Elevate or at Westside Community Church them to be the most impactful thing that we do all year. So be sure to get them involved. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm actually filling into uh, someone I like to refer to as the slightly less good-looking Pastor John. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he's actually in New York City. Uh, Michelle, his wife, uh, her, her grandma passed away, so prayers for sure with them. Um, safe travels for them. We're going to be praying blessing uh, on their life this morning. Uh, but to be honest, I'm very excited to be preaching to you this morning and to be bringing the Word of God to you this morning. And I, I really believe that as we uh, work through today and impact some things today, that God is going to move powerfully uh, in the hearts uh, in this room today. So uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Um, and just kind of a quick uh, backdrop of our story, uh, we're going to be looking at the story of the prodigal son, which is a very well-known story. And my hope today is to unpack and pull some things out of it uh, and maybe that you've never uh, heard before or that you've ever been taught before. Not, so it's not going to be really the, what you would uh, hear about at a VBS or, you know, in, in children's ministry. I'm hoping to pull some different things out today. Um, and so uh, kind of a quick backdrop is this. Jesus was at a party uh, when he was sharing this parable, and he was at a party hanging out with uh, who the Bible indicates to us were sinners, uh, tax collectors, basically the lowest of the low, because that's the people that Jesus rolled with. And he was at a party because our Savior is not a boring guy, right? We get this idea that Jesus was like this, this Gandalf-looking dude who was just kind of like depressed all the time. And, and the, the, the truth is, is the exact opposite. You see, Jesus didn't just give life, uh, but he was life. So everywhere that he was, life just kind of sprang up around him. And so Jesus was at a party hanging out with these people. And on this scene is where some religious leaders came on the scene. It was very, uh, it was a thing that happened a lot throughout the early books in the New Testament. And these religious leaders came on the scene and they started questioning Jesus for his motives. What, what is he doing here? Why is he hanging out with these people? To be honest, I think even the people that were there at the party, uh, the sinners and the tax collectors were wondering and questioning, what is, what is this guy doing? Because they knew who he claimed to be. And because what they didn't understand is that love cannot help itself than to go to those who need it most. And so Jesus is at this party. These religious leaders come on the scene and, and they're questioning everything about him. And so Jesus, he shares three stories, but with one purpose. He shares a story about a sheep, and he shares a story about a coin, and then he shares a story about the two sons or the lost son, which is the story that we're going to be diving into today. But he wanted to settle once and for all exactly how God feels about people who find themselves completely and utterly lost. So that's what we're going to be digging into today. Again, we're going to be in Luke 15, 11 through 24. And before I dive in, I'm just going to pray and give this morning up to God. So can you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for this morning. God, would you go before us, speak to every heart. Would you be speaking today? I just want to be out of the way and let you speak, God. So uh, just send your spirit here. God, we want to feel your presence today. We want you to do a work today. We had an amazing time in worship, and we thank you for that. So God, would you continue that work on through the rest of this morning? We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. So we're in Luke 15, 11 through 24, reads this. This is Jesus talking. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began, be, uh, began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But their father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate and to party. And that is the story of the lost son. And so starting out today, right off the bat, my question to you is this. Have you ever found yourself in your life completely and utterly lost? Anyone? Just me? You took a wrong turn somewhere along the way, and and you don't know exactly how you got there, but you just know that you are completely lost and you don't know where to go. And honestly, I'm not even talking about, uh, you know, some dramatic uh, soap opera moment, but maybe it's just you were driving down the street, you were on vacation, you were trying to follow your GPS, and you, you don't know how you got where you're at, but you're there now and you don't really know what to do. If you've ever heard me preach on a Sunday, I love to do two things when I start out. I love to thank God for my salvation, for saving me, and I also love to give God praise for my amazing wife uh, and co-labor. She's amazing and talented and beautiful and uh, amazingly smart, sometimes too smart, and uh, she is wonderful. And as smart as God made her, the most amusing thing to me that he didn't give her is a distinguished sense of direction. (laughs) And I remember when we were starting out, we, and, and honestly, and even now, we'll, we'll be driving on some you know, main roads like Garfield or South Airport, South Airport and she has no idea like, where she's at. It's, it's so much fun for me. Um, <laughs> especially when we're driving in two different vehicles and I'm, just, I'm going as fast as I can. But she gets lost very easily. I think my story of getting lost uh, or of being lost is much more amusing it's better or worse, depending on how you look at it. Um, when my wife and I were starting out, and this was even before we were dating, we had been doing tons of ministry together in the church, and she was one of my, uh, my youth uh, directors, and we were doing all this youth ministry and worship ministry and music ministry, and, um, and I reached this point where I started developing a lot of feelings for her, and I'm like, I don't know what to, to do with this, and how do you, I don't even know how to really start this like, relationship, and I want to date her, but I don't, I don't know, and how does, what does that even look like? I mean, do I pull the pastor card and be like, hey, I think it's God's will for us to spend the rest of your life with me, you know? Like, <laughs> it could have worked. I didn't, I didn't say that. And at the time, I didn't know all the great Christian pickup lines that I do now. And I've been, learning, I've been learning those from my youth kids. My youth kids know these great, fantastic pickup lines. And they taught me one a couple weeks ago that I should have used because it might have worked. And it goes like this. Um, is it hot in here or is that the Holy Spirit burning inside you? You know? It could have worked. But pretty much everything I do creeps my wife out. So that probably would have creeped her out too. <laughs> But in this point in my life, I was completely lost and I didn't know what to do and I didn't want to step where God didn't want me to step and I didn't want to start a relationship that he didn't want me to start and I didn't want to do the wrong thing and I definitely didn't want to screw up our friendship, my friendship with my wife because I screw up a lot of things. So I'm just like, I'm just going to stay right here. So as I was praying and as I was talking to God, I'm like, God, uh, you're just, you're going to have to make this thing happen and you're going to have to be the one that, that works this out. You know what I want, but I'm just going to stay right here and wait for you to work. And so only a couple weeks later, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, um, Christine, she came up to me and she, she says, hey, you know, I've been praying about this and I would love for you to come over for Easter and hang out with our family and spend some time with our family. Let me tell you, God has never been more real to me in, in any point in my life. I mean, the gates of heaven opened up and it was like, oh, just light shining on my, my mother-in-law, right, on Christine. And to, a couple of things you should know. Now, first of all, I... This is hard to believe, but I have a tendency to get excited. (laughs) And also, 
Christians have this tendency to like over-Christianize things, right? And over-spiritualize things. And I did both of those. I epically failed in both of those things in this situation. Um, and I don't know if I was just, I got crazy excited and it was like that scene from Bambi where he's like jumping on the clouds. I mean, that was totally me. And I don't know if I just got overexcited or I was looking into the future and I was seeing the beautiful caramel babies that my wife and I were gonna make, you know? I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, what it was exactly, but for whatever reason, my only stupid response that I had when my mother-in-law said, we'd love for you to come over for Easter was, hey, I'll pray about it. <laughs> what? I'll pray about it? It still keeps me awake at night. And to be honest, my mother-in-law brings it up all the time. And so I know I'm never going to be able to forget it. And I thought that sharing it today in the message would kind of help me. And it didn't at all. And that's on you guys. So, But the, the punchline of that doesn't really have any bearing on my sermon, other than to say this, that narrative that we read in Luke is God's uh, letter to us, to all of humanity, not just the audience that he had 2,000 years ago at that party, but for all of humanity, for all time, of exactly how God feels about those people who find themselves to be lost. And if you're like me, you reach points in your life where you understand who God is, you understand how big God is, but for some reason, when you try to communicate this area, even if it's a seemingly small area of your life where you may feel lost, you have a hard time going to God because for some reason we get into the habit of thinking that God is too busy with a lot of other things that are going on, and, and there's so many more important things than all the stuff going on overseas and ISIS. That's definitely going to keep God's hands busy, right? And so we, we don't take these things to God. We need to understand that our God is so big that he wants to know the big things he wants to know the small things, and he wants to know exactly how he feels about us when we are lost. So I want to give you just three principles. This is going to be a quick message today. I want to give you just three basic principles that are hopefully uh, that we can remember. I've made them very simple. Hopefully we can remember them um, and use them in the future when we feel lost. So the first one is this. In times when we feel farthest from God, we feel distant from God, he reaches out to us. He reaches out to us. The scripture says this in verse uh, 17, when the father saw the son, the, the son returned home. When the father saw the son, even while the son was a long way off, the father ran to him. Even while the son was a long way off, the father ran to him. Don't, don't just read over that. There's so much power in those words. While the son was a long way up, the father ran to him. In other words, the father never stopped thinking about his son. In other words, I, I believe the father uh, laid awake at night, you know, sitting out on his porch, looking expectantly and hopefully waiting to see his son again. I absolutely love that. Even while he was a long way off, he was distant. The father saw him and he ran to him. It's absolutely mind blowing. I mean, to be honest with you, if that was me and my son in the future came to me someday and said, you know, hey, you're getting old and decrepit and you're, you know, you have Alzheimer's and varicose veins and all this stuff. I want half of my stuff and I want it now because you're going to die soon anyways and took half my stuff and rent to Grand Rapids and boozed it all away and gambled it all away and then he tried to come home and I saw him a long way off I would definitely run at him too but that running would end with the flying sidekick and a throat punch right <laughs> and I think for a lot of us it would see that love is absolutely illogical it doesn't make sense but the father saw the son from a long way off he doesn't give him a sidekick he runs to him he throws his arms around he hugs him and he kisses him and he tells them that he loves them, and then they have a party. What is that? Even while he was a long way off. See, I think sometimes we, we get to the um, habit of thinking that our God uh, isn't big enough to handle all of our problems. We don't go to him when we feel lost. Listen, it doesn't matter how distant, how far away you think you are from God, the mistakes you've made that have created that distance between you and God. I believe in a God who sees us even when we're a long way off, and he wants to run to us and throw his arms around us today. I believe it. Listen, God isn't, isn't a God who's a tyrant and who, who sits there with his arms folded and says, well, you made your bed, now you got to lie in it. 
That's not our God, right? He's not this tyrant that sits on a throne while we're groveling and crawling to him and trying to communicate and, and make right this, this way that we've, we've created this distance and we feel lost and that's not who he is. You know, maybe some of us have had parents that have been the kind of parents that, you know, would sit there and shake their finger and say, well, what did you expect? That's not our God. You see, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he reaches out to you. He reaches out to us. Do you know he's been reaching out to you all week? He's been reaching out to you all month. I believe that. You see, you thought, you thought it was just a random text message or phone call, right? Just out of the blue, someone that just was wanting to check up on you or see how you were doing or wanted to encourage you. You thought it was just a random like uh, Facebook uh, image or, or Instagram image that you saw with the, the scripture that had the combination of words that were exactly what you needed to hear. You thought that the time that you weren't, you didn't think you were going to be able to make it through the day or make it through the week and you had to work a double or you had to, you know, uh, work overtime and you didn't think you were going to be able to make it through and you get that supernatural uh, second wind out of nowhere that allows you to work the second half of the day or the week uh, even stronger than the first half. Listen, that's not coincidence and that's not happenstance, but that's the hand of God reaching out to you. He reaches out to you. Amen. He reaches out to you, and it, you have to understand that, that the God of this universe, he doesn't love us because we are lovely. He doesn't love us because we are lovely. He loves us because that's who he is. He can't help himself than to go to those. Love can't help himself than to go to those who need it most. It's not about our merits. It does, it's not about how good we try to be. It's about how good God is. It's about who we are as made in his image. And it's about who he is as being the embodiment of love. That's our savior. So he, he doesn't only reach out to us, though. It keeps going. He, he reaches out. And then number two is this. He rescues us. He rescues us. Scripture says this, that, the, that when the son came, uh, he, he came to his senses and he started to head home. The father saw the son while he was a long way off, and the father ran to him, and he went to throw his arms around him. And the son responded in the same way that we do with a lot of things. He pushes him back, and he, he, do, he do what a lot of us do, and, and he tried to right his wrongs, right? He tried to fix it. He tried to make it all better and smooth it all out. And so he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer fit or worthy to be called your son. And, and I just want to be a servant. I know I can't be your son anymore, but I just want to be your son servant, and I, I, I hope in some way that it'll make things better, and his father stops him, and he doesn't say a word, and he throws his arms around him, and he hugs him, and he kisses him as if to say, we're good. The debt is paid. You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me anything. Listen, the God of this universe wants to tell you today, not only does he reach out to you, but the same God has done absolutely everything required to rescue you today, no matter where you're at in life. What does that mean for us? It means that everything that you may struggle with, all your, your sins and all the, your, your doubts and all your fears and, and all your, your the temptations and all your insecurities, all of that, Jesus took that upon himself that in his death, all of those things would die there as well. But the story keeps going in that anything that would make us feel weighed down or bound up or held back from being confident of who we are in Jesus, Jesus overcame all of that when he overcame sin and death, and now a blood-stained cross and an empty tomb reminds us of a God who reaches out to us. Amen? He reaches out to us because we can't right our own wrongs. We can't right our own wrongs today. It's not about how good we try to be under our own strength. We can't right our own wrongs no matter how hard we try. And there's a God in heaven that is perpetually trying to remind us that the debt is paid, who's perpetually trying to remind us that he loves us. And all the while we're trying to sit and, and, and fully grasp the concept of this love that's actually illogical to begin with, and it doesn't make any sense. And so he says, just accept my love. Listen, he, he reaches out to us today, and he rescues us, and he doesn't even stop there. He doesn't stop there. He then restores us. He reaches out, he rescues, and then he restores us. 
Scripture records this, that the father saw the son while he was a long way off. And the father ran to him. Then he threw his arms around him. And then he got so excited and he took him back to the house and he said, hey, this is my boy and he's returned and I'm excited and Phil, uh, kill the fatted calf, find the calf. And the calf was the only unfortunate character in this story. Uh, he says, find the fatted calf and kill it because my son has returned and we're going to celebrate and we're going to have a party. And then scripture does something interesting and, and the, the, the father begins to observe what he's wearing and, and he's like, where's the robe that you left with? Where's your robe? Hey, get him my absolute best robe. Hey, we need a, he needs a ring on his finger to get him a ring and where's your shoes get him some shoes and I, when I was first reading this and, and I, I think a lot of us have maybe read this story or heard this story several times and it's easy to just read over that like the, the father he got excited and wanted to give him some clothes and some jewelry how cool is that right as I was studying I realized that 2,000 years ago when Jesus was sharing this story at the party with these these sinners with these tax collectors they would have understood they would have known that this robe that the father put on his son represented favor. That robe represents favor. That father was wanting to put favor and blessing on the son's life. Listen, it doesn't matter where you're at today. It doesn't matter who you, you, you the, the person you think you are, the, the, person, the, the third person that you think you've become, maybe you think you've become the worst version of yourself today. It doesn't matter. God says this, that he wants to put a favor on you today. That what the devil stole, that God wants to return to you in the form of favor and blessing. And he wants to put a robe of favor on your life. And the scripture doesn't stop there, though. It says this also, that he wants to put a ring. The father wanted to put a ring on his finger we need to understand is that that ring is see it signified importance and it signified value and the, the 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 father wanted to communicate to the son you are important to me you are special to me listen i don't know what insecurity you may be struggling with today what lies you may be listening to from satan that you're not good enough that you're not strong enough that you're not smart enough that you're not uh, uh, that you're not nice enough that you're not beautiful enough but i do know this that there's a god who wants to put a ring on your finger to crush through all of those insecurities and remind you who your identity is found in and that he views you as important that he views you as valuable and beautiful he wants to put a ring on your finger today but he doesn't stop there either. God doesn't stop there either. He says this, uh, the, the father in scripture in, in Luke 15, uh, the father, he says, he looks at his feet, and this is my favorite part, he looks at his feet and says, there's no shoes on your feet. Hey, we need to get some shoes on my boy's feet. I was confused, like why would, why, what's what, what up with the shoes? I mean, yeah, I guess he didn't, he lost his shoes. Maybe he had to sell them or I, I don't know. Listen, before, before when he, he had returned home and he was eating with the pigs, you see, he had, he had lost everything. He would be considered a beggar or a peasant, the lowest of the low in society. And as he went back home and as his father met him, his father wanted to remind him who he belonged to. That he was no longer a beggar or a peasant. He wasn't the lowest in society. He, was, he belonged to him. He was his son. No matter where you're at today, no matter where you're at today, there is a God who wants to put shoes on your feet and remind you who you belong to and wants to restore to you a sense of relationship and a sense of belonging. Who wants to put shoes on your feet and remind you that your identity needs to be found in Jesus and Jesus alone. I, I love that, that he, he puts shoes on our feet. He wants to give us relationship. He puts a ring on our finger so we find out who our significance is in. And he wants to put a robe of favor on us. And he offers that all freely. All that's left is our response. All that's left is our response. And we want to give you a chance to respond to that today. But in just, in just a minute, we, before we do, I just want to mention one more part of Scripture. In verse uh, 21, it says this. He was eating with the pigs, and he, had, he was at the lowest point 
This is the lowest point in the story, probably the most memorable point in the story. He was about to, to, to lower himself to actually eating with pigs. And then the scripture says this, the boy found himself sitting. Then he came to his senses. Then he came to his senses. In other words, then absolutely everything became clear. He knew what he needed to do. Listen, I believe there's hearts in this room today that, that maybe in some area of your heart, in some area that maybe you felt lost, you maybe came to your senses and there's a reality that's stirring in your heart. That's, it's not creepy, it's not spooky, that's the hand of God moving in your heart who wants to offer you today and he wants to remind you that he reaches out to you, he, he, that he rescues you. And he wants to give you restoration. He wants to remind you that he is the great restorer and he can restore any part of your life. Anything the devil stole, he wants to return to you in the form of favor, significance, and relationship. That's what he wants to do today. Can we bow our heads real quick today as we close? The interesting part about the story is that before the son headed home, he had that point of realization. He had to turn and head towards home. And while he was still a long way off, the father met him. I believe so much that all we have to do is turn our sights from the direction that we're going to the direction of Jesus. And it's in that moment that he meets us with his loving arms. If that's you today, if that's something that you're wanting, if, if this is, maybe this is the first time that you've ever heard that this, you know, this way, and, and you want that restoration, you want that, 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 that transformation that can only come through Jesus, we want to give you the opportunity to respond. So we're just going to ask on the count of three that you just lift your hand up so we can pray for you. And, and lifting your hand, it's just an outward symbol of what's going on inwardly in your heart. And I, and I believe that it just solidifies what's going on in your heart. And so we're just going to ask you on the count of three that you just lift up your hand. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. Hands going up all over the place. I see the hands in the balcony. Amen. Amen. God loves you so much. Let me pray for you today. God, we thank you for every heart that is here. We thank you for every hand that was raised and God, we know that you want to, to reach out to us. And God, we need some rescuing right now. And more than that, we need your restoration. And so I, pr I pray over every hand that was raised up, God, that they would receive restoration that can only come from you. And I think of Corinthians that says, if anyone is in Christ, and if anyone makes that choice to turn towards Jesus, you come in, you do a mighty work, that everything that was no longer is. And you bring new things and you bring new life. And you bring transformation. So God, that's what I pray for everyone here today. And God, would you go before us as we, we sing and we worship about you in a minute, about how you make all things new. Would they be more than just words on a screen, but would they be the cry of our heart today? We love you, God, and we thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Thanks, John. Can we stand together?
Westside Community Church. We hope to see you at one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m.